So, Stella, you've just come back from another another performance. Would you like to talk about where that was and, and uh, what you did there? Yeah, I did a performance at Scott Livesey Galleries. Um, it's an exhibition of um, and a small retrospective of past suspension performances, which occurred between 1976 and 1988. Uh, but I wasn't really satisfied with the idea of just having uh, photographs. I mean, they're, they're very beautiful, but they've become remote in time and, and, and rather sort of abstract, really. So. I kind of gradually convinced myself I should do another suspension in a sense to reanimate the images, expose the physicality of these suspension performances, but also simultaneously it not simply to loop back to a, a past performance strategy, but also to look forward with this new ear on arm project. And, and so this suspension occurred um, above the four metre long sculpture of the ear on my arm. So the body was lying on the, on the sculpture, the insertions were done, uh, the cables were, were, were connected, and then the body was winched up, only about 50 centimetres above the sculpture. But as soon as the body assumes the full weight uh, it begins to spin. So this suspended body is spinning above this ear on arm sculpture and the spinning lasted 15-16 minutes uh, and when the spinning stopped uh, the body was lowered down so uh, from lift off to touch down it was approximately 15-16 minutes. Um, and I, I think for the people who were able to see that performance there was the realisation that this was a really physically challenging thing to do but also um, so was the ear on arm project which has required several surgeries and this year um, I've confirmed with the stem cell uh, expert in Spain that I will undergo uh, further surgery and stem cell work to grow a soft earlobe and to augment um, the helical structure um, of the uh, ear on my arm. So that'll definitely happen this year. Really? Yeah. Do you have any sort of uh, metaphors for suspension? Well, I, I mean, I think the word for me um, uh, to suspend means in effect to be between states but to be between two irreconcilable states so to be suspended is to be neither here nor there neither up nor down um, neither to be a body nor to be this field of, of information um, to be between the gravitational pull and the information thrust. So I guess that's the way that I, th I think of the suspended body. Um, it's very much a, a physical challenge, but it goes beyond the physicality to um, a kind of choreography of trajectories, intensities and, and affect. I, I, I was thinking, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and of course we're, we're you know, increasingly expected to perform in mixed realities and, and so this body has become a kind of contemporary chimera of meat, metal and code and we have to seamlessly slip between the biological, the technological and the virtual. And, and so the suspension event is, is, is neither simplistically a, a, a physical performance um, nor can the body be considered uh, a body without augmentation to technology and the information flow within which it's immersed. Like a metaphor for the ear on uh, what, it, what it's been and what it's to become. Well, I guess for, for some people, the ear on arm 
is this kind of inexplicable and uh, inadvertent slide towards monstrosity. (laughs) In other words, uh, you know, if we start messing with the evolutionary architecture of the body, somehow out of control will engineer a a monstrosity um, that is neither human uh, nor uh, nor natural and and of course this to me is a, is a meaningless position to take because the human has always been about becoming rather than being um, and depending on our particular point in time in our history what it means to be human uh, has you know has been redefined and so now to be human is to be augmented by technology, is to be able to perform remotely beyond the boundaries of our skin, beyond the local space that we inhabit. Uh, We can't be human without our wireless media, without our uh, print technologies, uh, without having augmented vision. And and for example, recently, um, uh, a healthy a healthy child has been brought to bear from a 30 year old frozen embryo this happened in the UK and they reckon that they'll be able to increase this to 50 years so what happens then is that your sibling might be born when you're about to die um, or put in another way that the individual's reproductive cycle is desynchronizing from the normal kind of evolutionary flow of, 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 of human life and, 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 and sex and all of those other, other things that we consider uh, as part of being human. Also, um, as well as hydraulic heart assists, there's now been a turbine heart engineered, uh, which is smaller, more robust, uh, totally reliable, and would outlive the biological body's use of it. But this turbine heart means that um, uh, blood is circulated without, uh, without beating. So uh, you can put your head to the chest of your loved one. They're alive, they're warm to the touch, The problem is they have no heartbeat. Um, So that kind of prosthetic augmentation, again, decoupling us from what we consider uh, human rhythms, um, like heartbeat. And what about circadian rhythms? Do we really need, um, uh, you know, light and dark? I mean, in a world that's constantly illuminated, Um, you know, being regulated by circadian rhythms, being regulated by by heartbeats, um, and for example in the future being regulated by hormonal flows and adrenal flows in the body, um, all this becomes becomes meaningless and we can become decoupled from these uh, habitual and, and rhythmic couplings uh, that we associate with the body. It seems as though a lot of people are, are now using technology to decouple biological defects that they're born with. Well, I think the quality of our and uh, the quality of our lives now is largely determined by the technologies that we use, uh, and also the time of our death is determined by being switched off. Uh, In other words, um, the body will probably no longer have a biological death. Uh, Its death will be determined when its life support system is turned off. Um, So we're inextricably um, augmented on the one hand, but also made extinct by our our technologies. And of course, technologies um, also generate catastrophes and accidents beyond our control uh, which completely annihilate individual bodies. 
So uh, how we manage this becomes increasingly important. So the relationship, what's, what's now the critical relationship is not how you and me relate, but how you or I can manage our technological interfaces and avoid technological catastrophes. <laughs> because technology both enhances our life but also might uh, annihilate you know, our individual existence. <laughs> How are we to... Um, well, first of all, I mean, like, on that track, there's two questions. How, we, how can we bias the odds that we do not annihilate ourselves with technology? Um, and also, how, um, how can we get people more comfortable with using technology to augment themselves rather than just fix a defect? Well, I think um, uh, one of the roles of an artist is to do just that. Uh, artists, I think, are in the business of uh, constructing contestable futures. Uh, in other words, scenarios or simulations or uh, new aesthetic parameters. Um, now, these might uh, uh, enable us to question. Uh, they enable us sometimes to appropriate, often to discard, but it's always within the realm of contingency rather than necessity. So once we get into the realm of the imperative, uh, especially when we're talking about redesigning the human body, then we're on uh, difficult and dangerous and problematic philosophical grounds because we don't want to approach this from a eugenic point of view. Uh, I think what's more interesting and more comfortable um, uh, within our, our human society is to uh, factor in individual choice and allow us to feel that what we're doing is about contingency, not about, you know, an inextricable necessity. That's why I think the notion of the singularity is replete with all sorts of ethical and, and philosophical uh, difficulties because uh, uh, once we make something inevitable, uh, then uh, the realm of human choice and contingency uh, begins to, to evaporate. And I don't think that's where we want to go. We want to sort of construct uh, possible futures um, with uh, an element of choice rather than with um, something that occurs through coercion. So it's not about coercion, it's about choice. It's not about necessity, it's about contingency. Um, and so any kind of predictive futurist scenario is, is, is an awkward one. I mean, I like William Gibson's idea that um, uh, the future has already arrived, it's just not equally distributed yet. So we're in the business of constructing the future with every task we do, with every research that, that we, 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 uh, um, we engineer, uh, with every artwork that, that we produce. Um, it's these creative actions that construct the future, and the future is now. It's never something that will be. Um, you know, the world is always becoming. Uh, it's not, uh, you know, something that will happen. There's no such thing as a future, it's always happening. Well, yeah, I mean, of course, that's not uh, necessarily, you know, the only philosophical analysis of what a future is. But um, as an artist, I'm not interested in what happens in 30 or 40 years time. I'm interested in constructing an interface, experiencing it directly, thereby enabling me to meaningfully articulate what's going on. Uh, and what's going on is going on now.
Well, of course, the, the Google goggles is 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 an interesting concept. I mean, but all it is really is is a is a consumer product that's um, come about through head-mounted displays, right? And connected to a GPS, you'll you'll be able to sort of uh, view information superimposed on your field of vision, uh, so you can look at an object or look at a building and see a plan, see who's in there, uh, get information about the history of the, of the location and so on. Um, at the University of Washington in, in Seattle, uh, you know, the HIT lab has for many years been experimenting with, uh, with um, using a, uh, a low-powered laser to actually uh, draw images or scan images directly onto your retina. So there's the possibility, for example, of having a, a 3D um, object or 3D image which looks like an object to you, um, animated in your field of vision, but it's artificial, it's not really there. Um, and of course, we've read about these new contact lenses, um, only capable now of, of projecting sort of one pixel of information, but they reckon they could uh, fit in a couple of hundred. Um, so in the near future, we'll be able to just to pop in these very convenient contact lenses and uh, the body then will have true augmented vision without any encumbersome in, in, you know, technology uh, you know, like a head-up display or, or anything that will make you look less than what you do now. Um, that's the problem with wearable technologies. Uh, in wearing them, uh, you obscure and obstruct the rest of the world and you uh, change your social relationships with people. If you've got a contact lens on, that won't be a problem. So people are now encumbered by technology, but in the future as it gets incorporated into the body, it will just become part of them, really more like a, a at the tip of their ego almost. Well, I, I think that uh, there is an argument to be made that all technology in the future will be invisible because it'll be inside the body. Or put in another way, anything, anything meaningful that occurs in technology uh, will occur inside the body. Because the body needs a, a more adequate early alert warning system at a cellular level as to what pathological changes are going on. Um, the body needs to be more intimately interfaced with the internet um, and any subdermal um, implants will assist in that. But then um, there's the epidermal electronics uh, that have been recently developed that uh, are effectively stick-on circuits. Um, so this is at uh, the University of Illinois, I think, in Iowa. Um, I'd have to double check that, but uh, uh, there you have the possibility of simply sticking on electronic circuits directly onto your skin. If you want to monitor your brain waves, you stick you stick this uh, circuit on on your forehead, uh, connected to a stick-on wireless transmitter. You can monitor. Uh, your body functions wirelessly transmit them and when you're fish finished you can just simply peel off the electronics. So it again makes for a more convenient and more intimate interface with other technologies or the internet uh, and it, it makes for uh, less of um, uh, less human encumbrance uh, with technology. Yeah, I think the metaphor of, of, of the suspended body, of course, can, can mean on the one hand uh, being sort of suspended physically uh, in the world where, where your body might hibernate or your metabolism can be slowed down to the extent that perhaps your longevity increases. Uh, and so on, but also it can be suspended between, and it is now, between the actual world and, 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 and virtual management of, of data streams 
Um, so this idea of, of suspension can be applied in as a useful metaphor in, in many other ways of, of interface and interaction. Yeah, I mean, uh, what, why should, you know, your eyes be stuck in your head and pointed outwards in, in, in one direction? I mean, that's a very limited field of operation. Um, why not have an eye in the palm of your hand or an eye at your fingertip where, you know, you might be able to look at yourself, you might be able to examine yourself, you might be able to look behind yourself. Um, why not have an ear on your arm when you can actually speak into your ear, uh, where you can a hand your ear over to someone else. So I think uh, re-examining alternate anatomical architectures um, where our our sensory organs, in a sense, are externalized and uh, become more enabled uh, for uh, uh, self-examination uh, and uh, for appropriate um, early alert warning systems internally. I mean, we need to sort of inverse this idea of just simply looking out into the world. Uh, we have to come up with strategies of literally looking inside of us and generating the sorts of surveillance that are much more useful than just the public surveillance systems that are just simply used now for safety reasons or for policing the populace or for coercing and, and controlling behaviour. Uh, let's put surveillance systems into much better use and uh, apply them to, um, you know, individual survival. There's the idea of participatory panopticon, where everybody's um, casting their life and you can see many different perspectives on the same thing, which is awesome. Imagine being able to see through the eyes of like a swarm of people. Yes. No, absolutely. And, uh, and of course, um, uh, this idea of, of being able to see with the eyes of someone in London or hear with the ears of someone in Montreal while simultaneously someone in Tokyo is remotely activating your arm to perform a task here in Melbourne. Uh, I mean, these possibilities are already plausible. Um, it's just a, a matter of applying present day technology uh, to, for example, an artistic performance which indicates uh, not only the aesthetics but the ethics of doing these sorts of things. So um, part of the ethics of, like, uh, of using technology for surveillance or um, as little brothers and sisters instead of one big top-down brother and sister is everybody's looking out for each other. And I, and I think why <clears throat> why the inter internet uh, works as a realm of operation um, uh, is, is that um, there people are, are using it uh, through choice, not through coercion. Um, people can switch on and they can switch off. Um, they can look through the eyes of a webcam they can uh, uh, read someone's blog, uh, they can tweet somewhere else. Um, so, so it works because human choice is, is, is engineered as uh, an integral part of the structural organisation of, of what's going on. You're going to be speaking at the HBAR Summit in Melbourne. So that's going to be on the 5th and 6th. Have you got anything to say about that? <laughs> no, well, I, I am looking forward to the uh, Human Plus uh, uh, conference because, uh, you know, there'll be people with alternate viewpoints uh, presenting very challenging ideas and it's always interesting for me to try to analyse, incorporate, uh, compare, counterpoint the ideas that this body has um, with 
the ideas of, of other bodies. Um, but I think uh, what I'll be exploring and, and expanding on are uh, uh, what my present projects um, have generated. And um, uh, for example, the, the, the small robot that's going to be able to climb up my tongue and into my mouth, um, that is presently being engineered and hopefully the performance uh, that will be web streamed will occur um, in the coming months and of course I'll be able to speak more about this project if, if, it, if it's realised in time. Um, so I think what's meaningful for me is, is, is not to speculate but rather to speak about uh, projects and performances that this body itself has experienced and can authenticate. One of the things I really like about what you're doing is the fact that you're not taking a, a direct utilitarian um, approach to, to using technology from our point, like from our uh, point in time. To make people more comfortable with a more intimate relationship with these micro and, and ultimately nano-sized robots uh, that will repopulate the human body. Um, so uh, I think it's really a matter of uh, being open to possibilities um, rather than trying to script a future through um, a kind of a linear speculation uh, about what's happening because there's always something that's unexpected that um, uh, alters the ratio of possibilities that generates, you know, unexpected possibilities. And, and that's what's exciting about any future, that it's not predictable. And that's what a future is, an unpredictable realm of possibilities where every act now collapses into a new possibility that might generate an unfolding and further collapses um, in, into other, 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 other directions. So, yeah, I don't think we should, we should be too deterministic about, uh, you know, what we'd like to happen. And, and I, I guess the difference between a scientist and an artist is that a scientist, uh, in, you know, sort of examines the world um, to see how it works and to thereby apply those laws um, for s some useful means. Um, and often new tech instruments and technologies are developed for that reason. And then the role of the artist is really to mess with what the, art, uh, the scientist has done and to possibly generate alternate and unexpected uh, directions. Yeah, no, because I think I think um, uh, both aesthetics and ethics um, are unstable media, um, and you know, in a in a dynamic unfolding uh, set of circumstances. So one shouldn't um, try to. Uh, tried to define uh, um, aesthetics and ethics um, as anything fixed. I mean, there are both historical and technological reasons why these will be in constant flux, in constant um, change. And what might be ethical now will not be ethical in several hundred years. <laughs> I was thinking, well, how, so if people are going to come to a conference based on the future, based on possible futures of science <laughs> and technology, what can they gain from it? Well, I, I, I think human plus should should not be seen as as a as a conference that 
determines a blueprint for the future, but rather, you know, generates contestable futures um, that can be examined, that can maybe be appropriated, can be discarded. Well, I think artists uh, have always been interested in new kinds of instrumentation, uh, new kinds of technologies that generate alternate information and images about the world, about the human body, which makes us uh, construct new paradigms uh, so that we can better understand what a body is, how a body operates. So really, anything that challenges you know, our present uh, concepts and ideas uh, will be interesting to artists. So artists have experimented with um, biotechnology, the, uh, you know, there are some artists working in nanotechnology, the, um, of course, you know, there are performances in Second Life exploring sort of virtual performative parameters. I think anything that is, is challenging and interesting and generates unexpected possibilities will be interesting for art and that means anything might be uh, useful for, for artistic practice and in fact my own work oscillates between the, the biological, the technological and the virtual um, simply because I don't think we can meaningfully um, separate these anymore you know that's what we've become, a chimera of, of meat, metal and code. And we shouldn't uh, see ourselves, um, uh, you know, in a Rousseau-esque, you know, biological way. We shouldn't see ourselves reductively as, as uh, coming to some sort of robotic demise in the future. Um, I think it'll be a much more complex and hybrid um, outcome uh, that generates a more intelligent uh, form of life. And a more intelligent form of life is going to be a life that can slide between these different modes of operation and also perform increasingly remotely and uh, be able to increasingly project its physical presence uh, to people in other places. It's a bit hard for me to judge what the future will be like, but having having a look at history and having a look at you know the hundreds of thousands of years that we've been an anatomically modern human beings, today seems to be in our day and age, and especially over the last couple of hundred years, seems to be some of the most exciting. Um, times to be alive in terms of technological development and the way that we operate in the world? Well, I think it's difficult historically because in retrospect we can look back with hindsight and, and, and be able to sort of examine history and, and, and uh, really evaluate it, but I think any point in time is important uh, in its own right, uh, but uh, certainly what is happening is um, an acceleration, an intensification, uh, an increasing precision and power with our uh, computer technology and with our understanding of genetics and cognitive sciences uh, that in any one individual existence uh, we get to experience, uh, you know, uh, a much more expanded sense of what's possible and I think being open to what it what is possible uh, not conjecturing on what is probable but rather being open to what is possible is the best strategy to take technology is being used to um, to help people communicate and connect on a level that we, we haven't really been used to over the last 200,000 years. How do you think that will change in the future? Well, it's, it's difficult to say. I, I mean, uh, being connected, being able to communicate and collaborate 
um, this has always been possible to one extent or another in all of human history. Um, but once communication needed to be proximal, collaboration needed to occur in the same space that two bodies occupied. Now, of course, you know, I can be here in Melbourne and, and um, remote control a, a robotic arm in New York and perform an operation on someone over there, uh, you know, in a, in a, in a safe uh, and, and, and intricate way. Um, so I think connecting, communicating and collaborating, um, this will always be something that humans want to do. Now we can do it uh, in a more sophisticated way, in a way that is not bounded by the local space that we occupy and uh, we'll have increasingly technologies that um, can not only uh, do more precise and more potent manipulation of the world, but can do things like forward masking, where uh, time, um, uh, you know, is, is not a problem. So, you know, if we are going to be inhabiting, you know, other planetary bodies, uh, then the tyranny of distance becomes an issue, especially in remote controlling a robot, for example. But if we can factor in, if we can engineer uh, a virtual interface that does forward masking, uh, then we'll be able to perform um, with the same sort of continuity and uh, experience and causal experience uh, that we can do now. So uh, I think the strategies will be how to overcome increasingly remote operations. What sorts of sensory and, 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 and physical strategies can, can we come up with to solve these kinds of uh, you know, difficulties? So that's what will become important. You know, communicating, connecting, collaborating, that's always happening. Uh, but we're going to be doing it in increasingly sophisticated and remote ways. I just had a vision when you were talking about like somebody remote controlling like a huge mouth at somewhere like Times Square or London, right? And just continuously talking and blabbing at people as they get on and off the train and something like that. <laughs> you know, well, I mean, that's... Real mouth, like, like a flesh, flesh mouth controlled by like other devices. Well, I mean, it's, it's, not, in, you know, it's not inconceivable, of course, that, uh, you know, um, this body here can uh, um, access and actuate that flesh body, you know, over there and maybe even express emotions through, you know, uh, contraction of, of facial muscles and uh, that's one less step than, uh, uh, you know, activating a mouth and being able to speak with the mouth of the other elsewhere. Um, so that's, you know, not an implausible uh, um, uh, imagining at all. I, I think we're, we're very close to be able to doing those sorts of things now. And of course, um, in terms of determining and, and, and deconstructing, you know, what it means to be alive, what it means to, to, to exist in the world, you know, uh, it's not inconceivable that we can engineer artificial wombs and if we, if we engineer artificial wombs, it means that uh, a life can be brought to bear without birth. And then, of course, if we can artificially sustain that biological body through, you know, stem cell grown organs or printed parts um, or, techn you know, or prosthetic augmentation, that biological body need not die unless of course some catastrophe occurs but 
what that means is life begins without birth, life ends but not necessarily with biological death. Um, so how do we define individual existence anymore? It doesn't begin with birth, it doesn't necessarily end in death. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, genetic chimeras, um, uh, mixing um, animal, uh, plant and human genes, uh, this is quite possible and plausible, uh, turning plants into pharmacological factories, uh, enabling animals to produce fur or to produce milk that, that uh, has some specific and special use. Uh, yes, that's all, that's all possible. So uh, we can't discount this uh, mixing of, of, of genes. And again, another kind of uh, small disruption in the normal evolutionary architecture at a genetic level of, of, of human life or of, of life in general uh, on this planet. Do you think people will, um, or do you think it's okay to, to splice animals together and, and create life for an artistic and aesthetic reason? Well, of course, uh, the whole idea of bioart is to use uh, living cells in producing, you know, a, a sculpture or producing an installation that, that interrogates um, the partially living or the semi-living. Um, but of course, for me at the moment, um, bio art isn't very potent until we are able to stem cell grow or bioprint a lump of living tissue that's slimy, uh, that has orifices, that spasms, that breathes, that, uh, that screams, and we are able to handle this lump of teratoma-like uh, tissue, I think then uh, bio art becomes a very potent form of interrogation of what it means to be alive, what it means to be human.